Okay. Hello, everybody. Okay. This is Joe. Um, this is our uh, September Zoom presentation. Um, we're delighted to have Susie Knoll with us tonight. Um, as most of you know, Susie's an excellent birder, but she's also got quite a uh, strong background in botany, and she's going to talk to us about um, landscaping with native plants tonight. Um, Susie is the executive director of Oceana Conservation District, promoting conservation and stewardship of the natural resources in Oceana County. Prior to working at the Oceana Conservation District, she worked at Kalamazoo Nature Center as a field biologist conducting bird and plant surveys. She then worked at Native Connections, a private firm near Kalamazoo, creating and re restoring landscapes with native species. Susie is originally from Holland, Michigan. She has lived in Chicago, Belize, Mexico, and Costa Rica. She moved to Ludington in 2019. She enjoys tromping in the woods. We have to define what tromping means. Mm -hmm. um, boating with her family on Hamlin Lake, bird watching and traveling. And some of you may know, Susie also wrote this book, I think with Linda Harriman's. Uh, uh, with uh, Chip Frankie and uh, Linda Harriman's, yes. Okay. Chip Frankie was one of the lead, um, the lead birders helping us create that for the Oceana Conservation District. Yeah, it's a wonderful guide, birding guide to Oceana County. It's a wonderful read. If you don't have a copy, good idea to uh, check it out and pick one up from Susie. Um, I'll go ahead and step back and let Susie take it from here. Susie? Okay, well, thanks for the introduction. Yes, yeah, so a little bit more about myself before we get into my presentation. Uh, I am the current uh, executive director of Oceana Conservation District, and I've been there for over seven years now. Um, my dog is slurping out of the water bowl. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and yes, so out of college, I actually ended up um, moving to Chicago and working as a zookeeper at Brookfield Zoo and uh, working with primates. And it's funny because I, I probably would still be there today if I didn't meet my husband who um, is from Michigan like I am and after um, we met, we decided to come back to, to Michigan. But uh, since there aren't any primates in Michigan, because I was a zookeeper in the primate department, I decided to focus on birds. And so I was working at Kalamazoo Nature Center in the research department and uh, basically did a bunch of nest searching bird surveys. It was during the Michigan Breeding Bird Atlas that was uh, being done in the early 2000s. And I was doing a lot of riparian surveys actually by canoe. And I helped out with the annual bird banding program in the fall. I also got a little taste of native plants at that point because uh, the Kalamazoo Nature Center was really promoting native plants, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the home landscape, for example, um, and restoring grasslands. In fact, there was a 120 acre piece of the Kalamazoo Nature Center property that um, was going to be converted from crops, it was corn, into a, a, a prairie. And I had helped out with that and really enjoyed it. And the person that we hired to do it was Jerry Stewart out of Native Connections. And he's um, in Three Rivers, which is a little bit south of Kalamazoo. And I ended up, um, switching jobs actually and working with Jerry Stewart at Native Connections. And that's exactly what I did for the next five years was put in large scale prairie plantings, but also numerous tree and shrub plantings, uh, wetland mitigations, rain gardens. And I helped people um, select species for their properties. So um, after that, I um, stayed home with children for a few years while they were young. And um, when it was time, and we spent some time abroad again uh, in Mexico, actually at the time, my son was two and we thought it was a good idea to, to move while um, young enough and not in school yet. So anyways, 
I ended up getting pregnant with a second child and wanting to move back to Michigan and get um, settled in. And my husband took the first job that was offered to him and that was in Walkerville actually up in Oceana County. And that's what brought us over here. And we lived just south of Pentwater and Mears for seven years. But since we spend so much time in Ludington, my husband's a teacher now in Ludington, um, we, and we have sports and get groceries in Ludington, we ended up making the move and just coming to Ludington. So anyways, that's how we ended up here. A little background about myself. I really, really have a passion for going out bird watching. I wish I could do it more, but um, right now my work is a priority and family is a priority. So I get out when I can. Um, Anyway, so that's a little bit about me. I'm going to start sharing my screen and sharing some information about how to utilize native plants in your landscape. So first I'd like to hear from everybody to make sure that you can see my screen. Can everybody see the screen? Yes, it says it's Oceana fine. Conservation District. Okay, yeah. wonderful. All right, so little bit briefly about Oceana Conservation District. We, our mission is to promote conservation, stewardship and sustainable use of the natural resources in Oceana County. We work um, primarily with farmers actually to try to uh, encourage sound practice, environmentally friendly practices on their farms to uh, protect groundwater and surface, surface water. And we've, you've seen those big signs in this county, Mason County as well, that says this farm is environmentally verified. And that is our organization that, that um, helps those farmers be in good standards to be considered um, verified as environmentally friendly farm. But we also work with, uh, we have a forester on staff who works with forest landowners and helps um, um, landowners manage their, their forests in a sustainable manner. Um, and we also have been expanding services in our stewardship and education uh, departments. I just in the last year launched a, a nature-based preschool program, which I'm really excited about. And uh, in the last couple of years, we've acquired some property and um, we've developed a, a nature preserve. It's an 80 acre nature preserve. Someone gifted us beautiful 80 acres, a nice mature woodland in Benona Township. Um, so a broad scope of programs and services. Um, there's also, of course, the Mason Lake Conservation District that services Mason County and half of Lake County that most of you are likely familiar with here. Uh, locally. Similar, similar, um, similar programs and services, but each conservation district in the state of Michigan does a little bit different, has a different focus. So a little bit about us. And then, um, yeah, so let's get started here. I'm going to be sharing some species. I'm going to first start out with, you know, why and what are some of the benefits of incorporating native species in your landscape? And then a little bit more about some of my, um, my favorites to incorporate and then um, a little more details on how to get something like this started. So first off, several environmental benefits. One, you know, um, clear, clear benefit is providing wildlife habitat. As you likely know, um, development and agriculture have um, been really rough on the environment and um, there's been a significant habitat loss. Pollinators in particular, but also, also birds. Um, I think monarch butterflies populations have declined 90% in the last decade. You know, it's really astounding. Um, just um, because of development in possibly because of the pesticides used on agricultural fields. So anything that we can provide, even in our own home landscapes can help uh, bees and butterflies and birds. Ways that native plants can reduce pollution. Uh, well, every, every area in your yard that you convert to a native plant area or a garden, a native garden is less mowing. You will have to do less grass, less lawn. Um, so less air pollution that way. 
if you use native plants, you will use less fertilizers and pesticides, which are contaminating our groundwater. And of course, the noise pollution with, with lawn mowing. Um, similarly, improving water quality, not only by reducing pollution because it filters out all the contaminants, um, but also, you know, absorbing lots of water. You can see way on the left over here, there's turf grass. You see it over there, you can barely even see there's hardly any root systems at all. But then you look at all of the other ones on this line and their root systems are almost as long as, you know, or more longer than the vegetation that is above the ground. And this visual is really powerful in seeing how that really can trap all of the contaminants and all the pollution that would normally be headed into maybe a stream or a lake. Um, it's keeping it right there. So you can see how it improves water quality. Or because of those complex root systems, you can see how it can also help stabilize soils and prevent erosion. There's a lot of efforts right now along you know, streams and lake shores to put in native plants because they see the benefit um, as seen in these pictures. Reducing your maintenance and costs because native plants are already adapted to our climates and our soils and the native pests here, you will have less of the inputs, the watering and the fertilizers. Um, so it just makes a lot of sense. I also like to think that native plants really help provide a sense of place. You know, Michigan has wonderful um, plant life here and to be able to incorporate it into your landscape um, brings you a little bit closer to, to, um, to Michigan's botanical heritage. And then the next few slides I'm just gonna share as some inspiration, you know, just what some other people have done in their own backyard. Uh, now, some of these might be cultivars of native plants, and I don't necessarily um, promote that. I really do encourage people to, to plant and, and purchase plants that are, are native, truly native, and not cultivated or bred to be a certain color or height. Um, and there are plant, there are nurseries in Michigan that do sell the native, um, but you can get an idea here. They've got Leatris, um, some Blazing Star, on the right there, they got purple cone flowers, some black eyed Susans. It's really in a nice walkway going through. This is someone who put in a, a rain garden. And um, this is something we're gonna talk a little bit about later, but um, if you have a depression in your yard, or if you wanna create a depression in your yard, you can have a beautiful rain garden. In fact, when we lived in Kalamazoo, redirected water from our roof into a small area and planted a rain garden. And so, you know, planting, especially in the middle of that depression, some wet loving plants and maybe some other on the upland, on the upland parts of it, you can put some drier plants. You can have a wonderful little garden right in your front yard or backyard. There's another visual of a rain garden. We can talk a little bit more later about how, you know, what the depth is and, you know, what kind of soil composition you need for a rain garden. I'll briefly go over that a little bit later. Um, native prairie gardens, you can do something as little as, you know, on your deck, a, a prairie box, you know, even something like that, you would get a, a plethora of, of bees and, and butterflies. Um, for people who have a little bit more space, if they have some acreage, you know, plant, planting a prairie in the backyard. There's some rattlesnake master and some Leatris, uh, blazing star on the right there. And then if you have a lot of acreage, you could consider, um, you know, even if it's, you, it's a fallow pasture or, um, you know, maybe in row crops, but it's open, you could consider converting it to a pollinator planting. Finding plants for a woodland setting is a little more difficult, um, but we're gonna go over some, some plants that do work well in a woodland set, setting as well. So sharing a few of my favorites. Susie, can I ask you a question? Yes, of course. Um, when you say 
native prairie. Um, I've looked at some of the native prairie uh, packets that you get from the catalogs and stuff like that. And they're usually from out of state providers. Um, is there such a thing as a good selection of plants that would be optimum for a Michigan prairie? Yes, there are some sources for local seed, um, for sure. And I would, I'm glad that you're aware that you look at the packets and you see where they're from. A lot of time they have, you know, species from way out west that just aren't, don't occur here. Right. Uh, so yes, finding, finding a source locally, I can give you a resource right now. The Michigan Native Plant Association um, is a great resource. They have a website that lists all of the different nurseries that sell plugs and seed that are, you know, native to Michigan. It's the Michigan Native Plant Producers Association. All right, so it's Michigan Native Plant Producers Association, mnppa.org, I believe. M-N-P-P-A. Okay, dot org. Yes, yep. Okay, all right, I'll step back. All right. So some of my favorite sun-loving plants that, you know, are normally found in a prairie, but would work wonderfully in, in your backyard. Uh, the first couple are early bloomers, lance leaf coreopsis. Although they're, they do tend to a few, I mean, they come out mainly in the early summer, like early June, but you'll find uh, some, some plants still bloom all year round or they, re, they uh, you know, different stems bloom throughout the year. Lupin is a, a beautiful plant that grows here naturally also an early bloomer and gives some early, early summer color. And this plant of course is known for um, the host plant for the Carner blue butterfly uh, endangered species. And I know in Oceana County, there are some, some places where uh, there's large stands of lupin in the forest area. And uh, it's really, it's really a um, beautiful plant. Um, and the, actually the leaves will stay around all summer long and they're quite nice too. They bring nice foliage. Butterfly milkweed is one of my favorites just because you can't, you don't usually see bright orange in gardens, uh, not too often. So to have a native species that's bright orange is wonderful. And of course, as the name implies, the butterflies do love it. It's um, one of the host species to monarchs uh, as being a milkweed species. There's a few sylphium species. This is a picture of a compass plant. It's a real neat um, plant that orients itself to the sun, where the sun is. It just turns um, wherever the sun is. Now, I can't say, and maybe Dave can back me up here. I can't say I've ever seen it in Oceana County or Mason County. So I might caution against utilizing plants in your yard that aren't native to the county. Dave, have you seen compass plants or any sylphiums native here in this county? Um, yeah, they're native further south. Okay. Um, but um, my general thought is if you're maintaining a small number of plants in your yard where you can make sure they don't overly spread, uh -huh. that's one thing. But unfortunately, um, some people have been persuaded to naturalize plants. And if somebody were to plant a couple acres of compass plant this far north, that would not be something I would recommend at all. Right. There yes. are no native uh, insects that have adapted to eating a plant that's found four or five counties to the south. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. And yes, so when I lived in Kalamazoo, this was this was seen and, and naturally, yeah. Okay, well, thanks for that. Um, so maybe perhaps in a small, you know, backyard setting, no problem, but if you're doing a large scale pollinator planting or something, uh, caution against using that particular species. Bergamot is uh, another nice one. It's actually, um, also called bee balm. It's in the mint family. And 
certain bees and butterflies have, and hummingbirds actually have just the right um, mouth parts to get right in into those um, unique flowers. Um, it does spread. So if you do like in a sunny area, at least it does spread kind of nice if you want something to fill in. It's a nice plant. Uh, Western sunflower, there's a few different sunflowers like false sunflower, Western sunflower, oxeye sunflower. Again, I would, I would perhaps um, encourage you to go to Michigan Flora uh, website. It's a U of M website. I think it's michiganflora.net and um, just finding what sunflower is native to, to Mason County and, um, and planting that species. The, the last two here are um, New England Aster and Stiff Goldenrod. And both of those are fall blooming flowers. I encourage people to plant them together because they bloom at the same time and to have the purple and the yellow at the same time is really quite nice, colorful. I know that goldenrod does get a bad rap as far as um, people thinking that it causes allergies and they might be hesitant. Many people are hesitant to plant it. However, um, it's unless you're like rubbing it into your nose, it's really not the goldenrod that's calling, causing people the allergies. It's the ragweed that is blooming at the same time. So um, don't be afraid to plant some goldenrod in your backyard. They are bee and butterfly magnets. And that's definitely a nectar source that they need this time of year because they're blooming right now. One more slide of some native sun loving species. Uh, some of these again may be worth checking to see if they are native in our area. Lead plant is actually a shrub, um, but it's very, it looks more like a you know native plant to me because it's only you know knee high. It stays pretty short to the ground. It's a beautiful plant. It likes dry um, sandy areas. Um, Rattlesnake master, Dave, is that is that native here? Um, I can check it a little bit, but it, it's found, uh, I think, in the lowest tier of counties. Okay. Um, I, I know the blazing stars are absolutely, they're one of my favorites. I love um, the blazing stars. This one is a rough blazing star. I think that's um, Leatris aspera. Um, but there's also a couple of others like cylindrical, or it's also called dwarf blazing star. And that's Leatris cylindrica. Looks very similar, but um, I just I just love the, the unique form and the shape and, and planting a clump of those um, are just really quite beautiful. Another Coreopsis species. This one is a, a tall Coreopsis. I have not seen this one in Oceana or Mason County like I have in the uh, with the landsleaf Coreopsis. Um, another Silphium species is Prairie Dock, very um, tall, mainly found in, you know, prairies out where prairies are mainly known, you know, like in Illinois and Iowa. And then there, there's a couple of um, Rudbeckia species. So we've got, a, you know, most people know the black-eyed Susan, Rudbeckia um, herta. And then there's also a, a brown-eyed Susan, similar, but this much, you know, the petals are much smaller called uh, Rudbeckia triloba. And um, both of those species blooming a little bit different time, a little bit different heights, just adding uh, a little more diversity to your native garden. And then also another aster, if you plant New England aster, you could consider planting a couple of other um, lighter blue, purple aspers. This one is sky blue aster. There's also smooth blue aster um, for a couple other options for late season color. And I don't want you to um, forget that, think about adding some native grasses in the midst. And they really do give some nice structure when you have um, some native plants growing, it, it helps keep a lot of the plants upright. Um, some of the ones here, you know, there's a big blue stem with a turkey foot seed head on the top left here that uh, you see on many of the roadways and open fields. That's very common, um, but that can get a little bit taller. So that's five or six foot. And then there's a little blue stem that's the bottom right, which they're actually not related. It's not the same genus actually. 
um, and they don't look anything alike. So I'm not sure why they're called little and blue blue stem. But anyway, also native here and um, quite beautiful when you see the, the seed heads um, or the flower, it flowering right, right now, it really looks pretty. <clears throat> Some other ones, um, June grass, that's the second one there. It's something I planted along my steps at my Kalamazoo home. It blooms in June, of course, and uh, is really quite beautiful as a cute little clump. And prairie drop seed is another, another species that forms nice clumps. Canada wild rye, you may have seen along the lake shore. I've seen that um, along the lake shore here. It has some unique form there and um, worth considering adding into a native, a native garden. And there is some Indian grass. I have not seen in Mason County, but there is some native growing at Waukensha wetlands in Oceana County. And now switching over to some more of the shade tolerant species. This first slide is mostly pictures of the spring ephemerals that we all love if we have the opportunity to see them. But admittedly, they're very hard to find. Um, there's not many nurseries that can grow them. They're very difficult to grow and many of them are protected. So they're, it's not legal to transplant. Um, now, some, if you know of some place that is, you know, developing and you know that there's some spring ephemerals there, you are allowed to rescue them um, before development. And that when I, again, when I lived in Kalamazoo, um, there was a, a nursery there that did exactly that, went to and took in all kinds of rescue plants. So if you've got, if you're lucky enough to, to find some rescue plants or a, a nursery that's growing these, these are so wonderful. Um, they're just a joy in the springtime to see. Bloodroot is one of the first to come out and it's so interesting. They, they last like a day before their, petal, their petals fall off. Um, but they've got some really cute um, clasping leaves um, around their stem. Spring beauty, really tiny flowers, um, but beautiful. Trout lily is also called adder's tongue. Um, you're you're going to find most of these in some richer woods than we have right now and right here in Mason County. Um, I led a spring ephemeral walk earlier this spring in Oceana County, and there's someone there that um, has a 40 acre piece of property and has just loads. The whole um, forest floor is covered in these spring ephemerals and it is fabulous. So, and I'm gonna host that every year if you um, wanna sign up, um, you know, it's usually the first or second week of May that I, I lead that walk, um, but it's really, yeah, all of these. Trillium Dutchman's breaches, Hepatica might not be native here. Um, Jack in the pulpit, that's a super interesting plant um, that actually, I, from what I understand, depending on how, um, what the food supply is for Jack in the pulpit, it's either a male or a female plant that, that year. Um, and if there's um, ample food supply or food stored in its like um, tuber, you know, underneath the ground, then I believe it's a female um, with, is it two leaves or three leaves, Dave? Mm. I, think the, I think the females have, I think the females have two leaves. And then if it's a male plant, um, it doesn't, I think it has three leaves or vice versa, something. And if there's hardly any food stored in that um, tuber at all, I, I believe it doesn't flower that year. So it's super interesting plant. Um, wild geranium, if you can find it in any of the nurseries. I know Weesies has it once in a while, wild geranium. That's a nice shade plant. Some other shade tolerant plants that you can normally find in, in nurseries, especially native plant nurseries, is wild columbine. Um, shooting star might not be native here, um, might be in the southern states or southern counties of Michigan. Woodland sunflower surely is native here. I see that all over on the road size. Um, and and on the, you know, some of the asters that bloom in the, um, in the fall in the woods is this large leafed aster. Um, 
Macrophyllus, I believe is the species name. And then there's just two goldenrods that I'm aware of that will grow in the shaded and that's zigzag goldenrod and blue stemmed goldenrod. Um, but that brings a little bit, that could bring a little bit of cover, color to a woodland gar garden in the, um, in the fall time. But I've got two ferns on here that looks like they're the same one, sorry about that. But just adding ferns in your woodland um, garden is really what the best thing <laughs> I found because, you know, they're not only beautiful, um, the deer don't necessarily like to mess with them and um, it what provides some nice habitat for frogs and toads and, I really like gardening with ferns. I have a lot of woods in my area, so that's the only thing that grows. And then a few of my favorite wetland species, if you have a rain garden or live on the edge of a, a stream or edge of a lake, um, some iris species, there's a, another blazing star that's better for, for wetland and that's marsh blazing star. Um, Culver's root is really an interesting um, plant that grows along rivers and in fens in wet areas. Milkweed, is, uh, swamp milkweed, it's another milkweed species, but it grows in wetter areas. I like to plant the cardinal flower and great blue, they're both lobelia species, the cardinal flower and the great blue lobelia. I'd like to plant them together because they bloom about the same time. So having the, the red and the blue together is really nice in hummingbirds will um, will be attracted to them. Um, if you really, really want some of these wetland species in your yard, but you don't have wet soils, if you're willing to commit watering, you know, more often you could possibly grow them, but they really do like damper soils than what we have mainly here in, in Mason County. Joe pie weed and boneset are both uh, Eupatorium species or the genus Eupatorium and they, they are found mainly along uh, rivers um, in this area. And again, planted together is very nice to have the pink and the white together. Iron weed is a, is a really wonderful species. Um, it's bright purple, uh, but again, not sure if that one is native here in this county. Okay, so kind of getting into some of the my recommendations as far as planning for for um, for planting and the design. Um, really, you have to start with determining your site conditions and figure out you know sun and soil conditions really, because you really need to find the right species that are compatible for sandy soils versus you know mesic soils you know versus clay soils. So just you know figure that out first. And, and then select the proper species. There are numerous catalogs on different um, native plant uh, producers websites that give all of the details about what kind of sun and soil conditions they need. Um, and designing, I always appreciate, you know, having a design at the forefront. And I like to, you know, put things in clumps for some greater impact. Um, and then considering kind of, you know, their height, their color and in, in mixing that up. Um, and you really want something blooming at all times of the year because many of the native plants really only bloom for a couple out, a couple of uh, weeks actually. Um, so it's not something that you can necessarily have a full year unless you do a lot of species and can coordinate that something is blooming at all times. And as far as the plan, the timing of the planting in the spring, it's um, after the first, the th you know, the threat of the first frost is, is um, passed. So that's generally mid-May um, through early to mid-June. Um, you really want to avoid the midsummer planting because it can dry out. And then again, this time of year, you know, it's September and early October. Site preparation, honestly, is one of the most important steps. So if you're gonna be investing the time and the energy and the money into it, you really wanna make sure that you're, you're preparing your site. This was a rain garden that we put in at a school. And uh, this is in Kalamazoo. And, um, you know, Digging this out, you know, is quite extensive process. If you're doing something smaller in your backyard, though, you will want to remove that sod, um, rototill it, 
uh, if you, you know, if it's a larger scale project, um, my thoughts as far as using herbicide is um, in the end, I, I feel personally that the benefits outweigh the, the costs here. So if you've got a large scale planting an acre or more, herbiciding is an effective way to eradicate that, that uh, vegetation. And um, doing a couple of applications even before planting and having a full year of site prep, a full growing season of site prep is really the best, um, especially if you're planting by seed, but even if you're planting by plugs. If you're seeding, you're gonna you know, want it level and firm. Um, oh, I was gonna mention a little bit more about the, the rain garden site prep. So if you're interested in doing a rain garden, uh, recommending a saucer shape. So just gentle slopes at the sides um, and replacing two feet of soil. And in the, in the end, you're gonna want, you know, six inches of ponding depth in the middle of that, in that middle of the, the rain garden. And the soil composition recommended is 50% sand, 25% topsoil, and another 25% of compost. I have presented a whole presentations on just rain gardens. So if anybody has any questions or would like some more recommendations on rain gardens, I can, I can provide that if interested. Planting guidelines, you wanna plant an inch deeper than your plug or your pot. Spacing, I recommend usually one per square foot, um, but um, some of them you know, could use even you know, two feet apart and that's fine. I appreciate marking and labeling the plants just so I can, you know, especially if I'm just getting started uh, and getting to know these plants, it's really helpful to be able to know what comes up the next year and make sure that it's something that you planted and not a weed. Watering immediately right afterwards. And then of, then of course, you know, for the next few weeks, just until they're established. And I uh, really encourage mulching three or four inches um, if you're planting by plug and really helps to minimize the weeds. And then afterwards, um, weeding will be important the first couple of years until they get established. Watering as needed if you're not getting a lot of um, rain. We do not recommend any fertilizer or pesticides. That's one of the beauties of, of planting native plants. And you could certainly welcome to you know, put any leaf compost on for mulch. Uh, I recommend keeping, you know, I, it, it can be unsightly, but um, if you're not you know, a neat freak, you can consider keeping the plant growth over winter, a lot of the, you know, the plants are producing seed late in the fall and, you know, birds going by can eat that seed and it provides cover in the winter for wildlife. So if you can stand it, uh, keep that plant growth and then cut it down again in the spring. And then I'm gonna share just a few slides for establishing a new planting by seed because you're not going to, if you've got a large acreage, you're not going to, um, it's not cost effective really to, to plant by plug. So um, this is a drill that our conservation district bought a few years ago. We've been involved in uh, lots of pollinator plantings. In fact, I think we planted 180 acres this particular year. Um, so it's, there's some cost share programming through the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service. And a lot of farmers can get kosher funds to convert cropland to pollinator or monarch habitat. And we are happy to provide the services to actually put the seed in the ground. So just a few notes about that site preparation. Here's some before and after pictures. It's really, again, I can't stress enough. You really have to eradicate the existing vegetation ahead of time. And if you don't want to use herbicides, it would, it would entail, you know, tilling that ground continually for an entire growing season, um, just to really knock out those weeds. Um, otherwise herbiciding um, really are the two options. Again, there is a good, and we have a no-till drill, so we've, we can um, 
we can drill the seed right into the ground through existing vegetation like this, which is, which is good for erosion reasons. Uh, as far as getting your seed, uh, painting it, um, I recommend really trying to find a local source. And I know from experience that Michigan genotype seed is quite expensive. Um, my personal thought is using more of a regional approach, sticking with um, seed that has a genotype of, uh, with a great, within the Great Lakes region um, makes sense to me. So I personally have um, utilized seed companies in Wisconsin, in Indiana, and um, in Michigan. So just staying within the Great Lakes region um, is something I recommend. A lot of times, You'll get from Pheasants Forever, for example, you can get really cheap seed, but again, kind of as what Joe was alluding to earlier, you, what you run in there, run, in, run into there is, yes, it's very cheap, but the reason it's so cheap is they can, they can um, harvest seed from, you know, huge, large areas out West, you know, like Wyoming or Montana or Nebraska. And, you know, having that far, you know, genotype from that far away is not going to be great for local genotypes that are, you know, adapted to our particular climates. So um, that's, that's something just to be aware of. Um, and again, looking into the Michigan Native Plant Producers Association that lists all of the local um, uh, nurseries um, is a good idea. Oh, I wanted to go back there and talk a little bit about seeding rate. If you are planting by seed, um, what you wanna shoot for there really is seven to 10 pounds of, of seed per acre. And you, know, a, you could do a 50-50 ratio if you wanted to, if you did four pounds grasses, four pounds forbs. Forbs is another word for wildflowers. So, um, but you can mess around that ratio and the more wildflowers in your mix, the more expensive it's going to be. So if you want more of a grassland, that's gonna be cheaper for you. And then maybe just add a few forbs, at least that would bring some, some blooming, um, you know, nectaring sources for, for pollinators um, and seed for birds. But um, yeah, you can, you can really play around with the ratio there to work on and meet, you know, your budget pretty much. And I do recommend using a cover crop at the time of planting to really help with weed competition. Um, just some regular seed oats and annual ryegrass is what we have used. And um, that comes up right away and helps with the weed competition that first year. Um, and it really doesn't, and then it, you know, it, it kills over the winter on its own. So um, it's really um, something that we recommend there. Installing by seed, you can either hand broadcast if it's an acre or two, um, using some type of a filler material is best to bulk it up a little bit. We actually have a hand crank seeder available for landowners in our office if anybody wanted to use it. Um, we usually recommend broadcasting it twice. So once in one swath and then you know breaking it in half and then doing the other half uh, perpendicular so that you get good coverage there. And then like lightly raking it in or, or even using a, a roller um, would be a good way to make good soil to seed compact. But for larger areas like what we've talked about here is uh, we really recommend using this drill. It's a, it's a Truex drill that's specifically designed to handle native seed. Um, and it's got, you can see in that top picture that there's different boxes, there's different hoppers I should say and they've got these augers in there. And this is, this is the hopper that's for more of the fluffy uh, seed. Most of the grasses, the native grasses are fluffy and many of the wildflowers are uh, much smooth, small and smooth, uh, easy flowing seeds. So that gets in a different hopper. But um, this is a pretty expensive piece of equipment, but pretty cool uh, that it can um, drill that seed right at that proper depth. We need it at a, about a quarter inch below the seed or before the, be, uh, below the soil there. So um, that's the way to go if you've got large acreages, you know, anything over an acre really. And then as far as maintenance for a big seeding like that, um, recommend mowing it down actually most of the year, uh, that first year, because 
your your the weeds are going to be the most prevalent that first year. In fact, your the the plants the seeds that you're planting in the spring, you know, the native seeds, they're only going to grow a, a few inches that first year. So what you're doing is you're mowing it down for it four to six inches when the vegetation reaches about a foot and then um, keeping it there at four to six inches um, will really help um, knock out the weed seeds that are there. Second year mowing is still recommended, but keeping it now to eight inches instead of four inches. And then the third year, um, you know, burning actually is a really great way to maintain. It really promotes the, the native plants and it um, knocks out all of the noxious and the uh, non-native plants. But, um, you know, burning is an expensive option to hire it out and generally not recommended for the, for the general homeowner. Um, so, you know, keeping it mowed or mowing it down in the, in the spring um, is some way to uh, keep it tidy. And then uh, just a few pictures too about what you can expect. If you're planting by seed, you can't really, I really can't lower clients' expectations enough the first year, honestly. It's going to look like weeds. It, re it really is. You can see right here, there's some rows of oats, you know, that you can see right there, but it doesn't look like much. You're lucky if you get some black eyed Susan blooming, right? Because the weeds are just more, are gonna grow taller. A lot of the wildflowers in fact need a winter stratification. So in order for their seeds to germinate, they need to go through a season of winter before they even germinate. All right, year two. So your grasses really should be starting to come out at this point. You can see some big blue stem blooming there. Um, but the weeds are still persistent. And it's really not until the third year that um, the plants are really getting established and looking nice. So just have some patience um, if you're gonna be going this route. And a few notes on the cost um, for seed. Um, seed mixes really, there can be a range of like $100 an acre to $1,000 an acre really. Um, $100 is going to be mostly grasses and hardly any, if any, um, wildflowers. Now, we had a client who had a four-acre planting in Oceana County, and she wanted it to be the most showiest, most colorful feel, you know, field that she's ever seen out of her, you know, uh, front window. And she wanted a $1,000 an acre seed. And that's, you know, over the top. But most you're going to run into a, a nice mix is going to run you at least 350, if not $500 for a nice mix. And then, you know, to install it uh, with a tractor and drill, you're talking anywhere between 40 and $300 an acre, depending on how many acres. All right. And like I mentioned before, there are some cost share programs through the USDA in our office, but also in the Mason Lake Conservation Office. They, um, I think Seth is his name and he can um, link people up to one of these programs. Conservation Reserve Program is specifically for um, converting you know, cropland to pollinator plantings. And um, I think you have to commit 10 years and they pay you rent actually. So they not only pay 90% of the planting, but they will also pay, I think it's like $70 an acre a year for the next 10 years. So it's a good program. If you know of anybody who's got ag land that might consider that, uh, it's a good route to go. There's also the Environmental and Quality Incentives Program. That's another farm bill program that's offered through um, USDA. It's, we uh, internally call it EQIP. There's uh, some programs there that are available to um, do some plantings, um, do also some invasive species removal. And then there's another program called the Conservation Stewardship Program. So three, three opportunities for cost share programs uh, relating to um, planting native plants. So that's really all I have, um, but I'm open to any, any um, questions or discussions at this point. I had written down a couple questions. Um, Heidi? Heidi? Uh, 
Um, what, what about a, an evergreen type hedge? That is, oh. is there such a thing as that? Um, I know well, some, some junipers are native, you know, um, I went, you know, of course at the state park, there's junipers and, um, I don't know exactly what species they are, but that could be a nice hedge. Now they don't get much taller than waist high. Are you talking a little bit um, taller than? No, that would be adequate. I'm just looking for something to buffer the back part of the yard from the alley. Um, and I also want to do a prairie type planting in the alley itself. There's a strip back there where I've mm. got some milkweed but it hasn't really done a real nice job. Um, and I'd like to augment that with uh, some native, uh, like forbs, like you mentioned, and maybe even some grasses. Mm -hmm. Inside the fence, I'd like to put some sort of a hedge as a, a privacy block, but we have a very robust herd of deer in mm -hmm. town. And uh, they eat just about everything. So um, it's almost like you're forced into using non-native sometimes uh, to prevent deer ruining the entire uh, crop. It's, it's kind of frustrating. It is very frustrating. Yes. And some people have found some luck with, you know, the super stinky sprays, for example. <laughs> but yeah. that's, you know, if you can stand it. I mean, it is just horrid. Yeah. Uh, you know, applying that every, you know, few weeks. Um, but no, I understand. Um, and that's why sometimes I've just resorted to ferns because they keep our ferns alone. Yeah, right. I, yeah. yeah, we do have a lot of success with ferns. Um, hostas are totally, I mean, they're totally. Wild. Oh yeah, no, mm -mm. can't do hostas. Uh, but we've, we've tried the motion sensitive uh, sprinklers um, those are fairly successful. We may have to just bite the bullet and put an eight foot fence around the yard. Oh, that would be horrible. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Well, now, have you tried some like butterfly weed, purple coneflower, black eyed Susan? Yeah. Okay. And they like all of that? Um, no, they don't necessarily bother the uh, black eyed Susan uh, and the coneflowers. They, they leave those alone pretty much. Um, but I did notice that they did hit the butterfly weed a little bit. Really? Okay. And then some of the sunflowers, they, they like to nip off the, the blossoms for that. And um, I put in uh, some Saskatoon berries, plants or bushes, thinking I'd have a nice hedge there. Mm -hmm. But I ended up nibbling those down too. So, um, what about blueberries? Do they do they hit blueberries pretty hard here? Does anybody know? I'm not, I've never tried growing blueberries. I know that as far as shrubs, I've um, planted you know some shrubs and I put like those tubes you know until they get tall enough so the deers can't the deer can't reach it. You know they got those five or six nice. foot tubes that you can put. And yeah. then they just grow in there for a few years before, you know, they're tall enough so they can get tall enough that deer can't reach them. I'd love to have some cedars in the yard, but they would be totally wiped out yes. immediately, I'm sure. I know that is such a challenge. That's a challenge. And I, I should maybe come up with a list. <laughs> I don't know enough from experience though, what, what plants are, you know, yeah. Deer proof, because really you need deer proof plants, the plants. What I found though, if they're hungry enough, they'll just eat about anything. And yeah. that's the sad truth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Dave, you have quite a, what, how is your success with your plants? Do you get deer damage? At, you've got a lot of natives out on your property, don't you? Well, I used to, till the, till the deer started eating them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So yeah, it's it's a challenge. Um, they're eating even my white baneberry. I'm thinking, wow. wow, that's poisonous to people. 
I don't know what it's going to do to a deer. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fruit. That's where the, the poison's concentrated. So, I mean, yeah, really evergreens, yeah, but the brown juniper is the native one we have in this area. Um, but, yeah, it doesn't get that tall and, yeah, the, the deer aren't going to eat it because it has all these little barb-like uh, leaves. Um, but if you want to try to make a hedge out of it, good luck, because it, it's not designed that way. It, it's sprawling as a native plant. Right. So it just doesn't form a, a neat head. Can you think of any other recommendations, Dave, as far as making a hedge, an evergreen hedge? Well, you know, if we didn't have deer, you could plant Canada yew, but mm -hmm. <laughs> that's like candy for, for the deer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering <clears throat> about a tall uh, native grass. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, you could do like a few different species, you know, with big blue stem and Indian grass. They seem to leave that stuff alone, don't they? That's I don't probably think they're not down the, the, the grasses, I don't think. Yeah, deer love succulent plant plants, and uh, yeah, the, the blue stems are not particularly succulent. Mm -mm. By the way, they used to be in the same genus. But oh, were, is that why they were blue? Okay, all right. They used to be both in Andropogon, and yes. then the blue stem. I don't know where it came from, but it's now uh, Schizoparium. Uh, Schizoparium, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and just uh, for information, we have two species of spring beauties. Mm. Uh, Carolina spring beauty is a lot rarer because it has oval leaves instead of linear. Okay. We have two species of hepaticas, both are native. Okay. We have two species of blue flags, and both are native. Okay, good to know. Good to know. Oh, and um, been a heck of a lot of plant name changes, but uh, Joe Pie weed is no longer in Eupatorium. Oh, it's not? Okay. No, it's Eutropia. It's like, no, give me a break. They're and constantly course, messing around with those species names, aren't they? And then, and of course, in recent years, uh, the whole genus Aster got split into like seven or eight genera. And the only true Aster left is a European plant because oh. Asters originated by name in Europe. Okay. Huh. So the most common genus for our former Asters is Symphiotrichum. So instead of two syllables, we got five. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot more <laughs> complicated. Uh, that's too bad. Fred or Greg, do you have any questions? Uh, no, uh, I don't have a question. We were wondering a little bit about daffodils. We know that deer don't eat them and whether that's considered a native plant species or not? I know, I'm sure it's not native here. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's European. European, yeah. okay. But it's not that they're a problem, you know, Fred, it's not, yeah. they, don't, they don't spread or, you know, they're not invasive. So don't feel yeah. bad, you know, they're lovely to see in the, in the springtime, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's been really interesting. Uh, fascinating and mary and i have been uh, taking notes here and there and uh enjoyed it a lot great well if anybody has any anybody on the recording you know listening not live here in person wants to get a hold of me um i am happy to give my email out um and that's Susie noel at gmail s-u-z-i-e-k-n-o-l-l -L at gmail Happy to answer any questions, or if someone you know wants a recommended species list, I'm happy to to work with you. Thank you, Susie, for 
taking a uh, precious evening away from your family tonight and doing No, it's well. no problem. You're welcome. And um, we look forward to seeing you at, a, at some of our field trips and maybe the Christmas bird count. And um, we'll get the recording out to the members. And I just want the members to know that our next meeting will actually be uh, in person, finally. We're gonna have a meeting in the uh, Ludington Library in October and Dave is gonna talk to us about gulls. So that'll be wonderful to finally see everybody. Um, a quick question, Susie. You lived in Mears, so you were actually close to the Otto Sanctuary property. Well, so Mears is in Golden Township and the Otto Nature Preserve is in Benona Township, one township south. But oh, yeah, within, with it, it's, you know, south of Silver Lake. So 10, 10 miles away, probably. That, that's the preserve that you were talking about that was donated to the Oceana. Yes. Guys, right? Yep. Yeah, that's a wonderful spot. Everybody should make a trip down there. Um, I don't have anything else. If anybody else has anything to add, otherwise we'll let Susie get on with her evening and and we'll um, all move on as well. Anybody have any other thoughts? Good program, Susie. All right. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Susie. And you take yep. care. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good bye -bye. night.